Roxana, thank you, and thanks to Dr. Uh, Sharma and Dr. Kinney for inviting me. I, I probably am the only EP in the room, and I only wire a coronary sinus occasionally. <laughs> Nothing like the brilliant technical work displayed this morning. <clears throat> These are my disclosures, <clears throat> and I'm going to try to pick up where uh, Ken and Mike left off to kind of bring this together for a little bit of discussion at the end about where we're going. So this is what we know. In 2016, Pew Research assessed that 77% of Americans have smartphones, not any phone that's mobile, but a smartphone, designed by having a screen uh, and interactivity and mobile connectivity. What is also quite interesting is the penetration of smart watches. Right now, it's a little low, 13%, although the recent estimates are as high as 18 or 19%. But the relative growth is going up about 50% a year. And you can see the market share across different uh, companies on the side. There's been more of a shift to move into watches rather than fitness trackers because you just get more utility out of a watch. And it's the same reason people have moved from sort of dumb phones to smartphones. We also know that people and consumers and patients like this stuff. This was a, uh, one of our first patient pages in JAMA Cardiology uh, that Roxana mentioned. And this had the most views and the highest altmetric score for about six months um, this, uh, until the next patient page. And so people really care about this stuff and are interested in it. Wearables at present can measure a lot of things, as you see here. And some, in some senses, you can collect a lot of outcomes, as Mike said, for clinical trials. And you can see really good performance, for example, of a six-minute watch. There are no wearables yet that are doing much for coronary ischemia, although perhaps that's on the horizon. And so a lot of what we see in cardiology is really based on arrhythmia detection right now. Arrhythmia detection has made a lot of progress going from just simply transilluminating your finger with the flash or the light next to the camera on the phone and getting a heart rate no differently than plethysmography, all the way down to irregular rhythm like you saw with Ken, ad hoc ECGs, and some blended models that I'll talk about as well. The early work on looking at irregular rhythms actually wasn't so good, and the reason was these were looking in the way we used to think about AFib, which was 30-second episodes of AFib. And so the first attempt to really hack a smartwatch found a positive predictive value in an ambient population of only 8%, although the pre- and post-cardio version in panel A looked very, very good. Ken has really uh, mentioned this, and we can talk more about the discussion, but recognize that Apple is not the only elephant in the room anymore working on this. You can see Garmin, Fitbit, Samsung, and of course, AliveCore, that's more in a disease management space, all going after AFib. What is also fascinating is that Ken talked about this, uh, the irregular rhythm notification based on the heart rate sensor. But even in the course of a relatively fast trial where enrollment lasted eight months, new technologies were being introduced and on in the same series of watches that we see, which is now the ECG. It turns out, if you go back in history, one of the first ECG watches was in 1994 by the company um, that made Instrumetics, they made the King of Hearts Holter. And what you might notice here is a phone port, which was used to connect this to a phone jack so you could fax your physician, the ECG, and a memory download, because I think this could only hold eight ECGs or so at a time. Obviously, this had no uptake, otherwise more of you would know about it. And so how did we get from the one on the left to where we are in the middle with Apple, AliveCore, and other brands? And I'm going to show you that it's really these four things that are paving the way for us to use these devices and figure out how to implement them in the real world. There's lower manufacturing cost of the hardware. The hardware is actually quite cheap. We've moved away from phone ports and fax machines to cloud computing. Artificial intelligence for pre-diagnostic uh, diagnoses, actually, and a completely revamped and revitalized regulatory perspective on these technologies. And AI should not be diminished. This is from Sid Mukherjee who's across the way and wrote this in The New Yorker back in 2017. But if you look at ECGs and, and artificial intelligence, it turns out that deep learning, which is good at recognizing pictures, is remarkably well suited for ECGs. We tried to train a deep learning model using um, data from the iRhythm Zeo patch, and we used a gold standard of nine cardiologists, eight of whom were EPs, and they're all practicing. And what we found is that, a, is that the the predicted neural network label did very well against the ground truth of this committee of cardiologists. And you can see where they might have misclassified things. It's basically this is, this is truth. 
What is amazing is that if you compare the committee consensus label to now the average cardiologist, a whole other set of average physicians, regular cardiologists who just read ECGs, the deep learning model did better. And the other interesting thing is that when the neural network made mistakes, it made the same mistakes that humans do. You can see these patterns. So for example, you might misclassify AFib as SVT or sinus rhythm with these boxes, and you see that here as well. So if you can train a model to be at least as good as a human and make the same predictable errors, that's really when artificial intelligence starts having legs to be used uh, in healthcare. We are also going to take this to the next step, uh, trying to explore the hypothesis that rhythm-guided ad hoc anticoagulation in relatively low risk patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation may be as effective as continued NOAC therapy, but with a lower recurrence of bleeding. And so this is kind of going through various stages of proposals. There are other ways of thinking about AI, which is when you take a known measurement, but you use it to make a new diagnosis. So uh, the Mayo Group uh, with Paul Friedman has published this, which is to look for LV dysfunction based on a 12-lead ECG. And you may think that sounds crazy. How can you tell what the ventricle is doing um, from a pump standpoint from the electrical activity? It turns out it works very, very well, and these deep neural networks can find things and see things that we can't. The same is true for hypertension and sleep apnea with heart rate variability, as you see here. When we move away from arrhythmias and you look at heart failure, this is one framework of looking at sensor-based models for heart failure. And we also know that in my world of EP, we are moving to Bluetooth low energy devices. And so the idea here, this was first created for remote transmission. So if you have patients who have a device, they have a remote monitoring console on their nightstand at present, that's going to go away, and they're going to transmit on their phone. But now that brings new dimensions where you can get additional patient-reported outcomes. The patients can see their data. And again, this can be transformative, not just for care, but for clinical trials. Whatever can happen in the atrium, we can think about extending to the ventricle. And this is, during, this is photoplethysmography during an EP study with VT, sinus rhythm, pacing, VT, and VFib. And you can see what happens to the PPG signal. And so the question is, can you train a deep neural network to recognize this as VF or cardiac arrest and not that the watch is loose on the wrist or the watch is sitting on the table? And in fact, you can, and it's being done. And this can you know, be used to connect to a cell phone, call EMS, get bystanders to help you. And so this is also being explored by several companies as well. This stuff is not perfect. It has some challenges. These are some real cases. This is a patient who had syncope recurrently, who went to her pain management specialist who thought she was over-medicated on her opioids. She said that's hogwash. She went to Best Buy. She bought a watch, and she diagnosed herself with this and brought it over. The problem is, is that the AI models and the FDA approval isn't comprehensive yet for all arrhythmias. So this comes back as inconclusive. And only someone who understands how to read these would know that this was VT, which is in fact what she had, very, very, very fast VT. This is a patient who had syncope while running, saw me in clinic, it, I noticed he was wearing his watch, it said that his heart rate went to 183 at the time that he fell, his EP study and his whole workup was negative, and because you can't see the waveform, you don't know if this is truth or artifact or anything else, and so these are some of the challenges we have to face. Finally, some things just don't work. This is a company called Scanadu, which had a bunch of investors um, believe them when they said that if you shine a light on your forehead, you can measure blood pressure. Uh, it didn't work. The company has since been nicknamed Scamadu for good reason. <laughs> um, and so not everything works, and you really have to look at things. This is from The New Yorker. You can't list your iPhone as your primary care physician, something we all contend with with some of our patients. And so then the question is, who is going to be that doctor when you have devices? So this is the model now, right? Someone sees their watch. We all, we all have to deal with it. We might say we're getting too many notifications, although it's quite low, and we may prescribe additional diagnostic therapies or treatment. The next model, and the model I think that is in some ways both a threat and an opportunity for us, is telehealth. If you could just press a button on your phone and pay 50 bucks to be uh, spoken to by a trained clinician right away, would you do that? Well, the answer for the millennial generation is they value uh, convenience over pedigree, and the answer is absolutely. And if we were able to train a, a large group of uh, internal medicine and family practitioner doctors at American Well to handle the Apple Heart study, this can surely be scaled for clinical delivery. 
But here's the next step, which is the tech companies and the retail companies getting into healthcare. And in fact, this is being prototyped in China by Ping An, good doctor. This is an AI booth where there's no doctor, there's no oversight. It's you go in, you give your symptoms, it spits out whatever drug it thinks you need, and it's all automated. This is from Best Buy. This is going to be coming to you where these kits will be sold so that you can take your kid's temperature and have the telehealth visit. So this all is an opportunity. If we sit on the sidelines, we will be completely disintermediated. So I'll close with the fact that wellness has really, uh, wearables have moved beyond a wellness state into uh, really a pre-diagnostic or diagnostic state, starting with rhythm assessment, but much more. The integration into clinical care is early and a bit of an unknown. For arrhythmias, ECG is the gold standard. We don't treat based on irregular rhythm notifications. But as I've shown you and Mike and Ken, there's a whole new world and a whole set of opportunities for all of us to, to pursue. Thank you.